Susan. Um, yeah, welcome everyone to today's event, uh, which is taking place under the title Contact in the Past, How Language Contact Has Changed, Has Shaped Our Language and Society. Um, we're delighted that there's been so much interest in today's uh, panel, and we're lucky to be joined by four fantastic speakers who are going to introduce some of the kind of broader questions and challenges involved in conducting research on language contact. Um, just in terms of kind of format and structure, our panelists are going to speak, and they've got this fantastic joined up uh, presentation. They're going to speak for just over an hour, I think, uh, and share this sort of series of short presentations drawing on their own research, as well as some of the larger issues in the field. And then after the presentations, we'll open up, obviously, for discussion, further questions uh, and comments as well. Um, so now I'm just going to go on to introduce our, our four speakers for today. Um, so Dr. Tamsin Blackster completed a PhD at Cambridge on variation and change in Middle Norwegian. Tamsin is currently a research fellow, primarily working on spatial patterns of linguistic diffusion, diffusion as well as modern dialectology using data from, for example, Twitter and app-based surveys. Uh, Dr. Victoria Fendel completed a DPhil at Oxford with a thesis on Coptic interference in non-literary Greek uh, and an MPhil in theoretical linguistics at Cambridge, funded by a Clarendon Scholarship and the HRC, respectively. Um, Victoria is currently a Leverhulme Early Career Fellow at Oxford, working on uh, support verb constructions in classical literary Greek. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Castan is a lecturer in French and linguistics at the University of Westminster. His research is mainly in variationist sociolinguistics, with a particular focus on endangered languages. He holds a PhD from the University of Kent on language variation and change in Franco-Provençal, and has also recently been awarded a Leverhulme Early Career Fellowship to work on morphosyntactic variation and change in language obsolescence. And Dr. Robin Meyer is Assistant Professor of Historical Linguistics at Luzerne um, as of uh, 2020. Uh, he completed an AHRC funded doctorate at Oxford, working on historical syntax and language contact in late antique and early medieval Armenia and Iran, um, and has interest in comparative and diachronic linguistics and typology, and works on Armenian, Iranian, Greek and Latin. So just by way as a reminder, the content will start with some of the broader wide ranging concept um, involved uh, with the idea of kind of engaging a, a broader audience and then we'll focus a bit more on some of the in depth um, issues and, and exploration of the specific features. So I think without further ado, I'll pass over to our speakers for today's session. Thank you very much, Hannah, for that wonderful introduction and now just give me one second to share my screen with you and so that you can see what delightful things we're going to be talking about. So I hope everyone can now see something that sounds sensible or looks sensible rather. Excellent. All right, so good evening everyone once more and welcome uh, to this, our talk. Thanks for uh, joining us so numerously um, and we hope you are going to have as good of a time of this as we are about to. So we would like to talk to you about contact features and how contact in the past has shaped uh, our language and our society. And we're going to do this in a setting of a public access talk, because normally when we have Filsoc talks in May, these are very much talks directed not just at colleagues in academia or specialists, but at everyone who's interested. So um, all the super details and complicated elements that our research inevitably involves, uh, we have to save a bit for the end of the uh, talk and for the discussion session, perhaps. Now, what can you expect from this talk? Well, instead of the normal, very uh, well-established and um, eminent member of um, academia who will talk to you about their singular research, you've got four establishing slightly younger uh, members, but four and for the price of one, who are going to talk to you about uh, language contact in a broader context, but spiced up with their own research thrown in. So voila. We want to talk to you about the insights from language contact that we can gain um, and how they can influence our view of society and vice versa. And we're going to do so, as I say, as broadly accessible as possible, so with as little jargon as we can just about manage. And at the end, we are very help happy to talk to you about any of our individual research about language contact more broadly uh, or about the sense of life, as long as you can put language contact somewhere in there. How are we going to do that? Well, um, first of all, as Hannah has said, we're going to talk to you about how language contact might have cropped up in your life and what, how, what you might know about it. 
And then we're going to mention some of the big questions that researchers working on language contact are going to want to ask and know about. Followed by then four insights into our individual research. So I am going to talk about alignment change and how language contact figures into that. Victoria about bilingual interference in Greek and Coptic in antiquity. Um, Tamsin is going to talk about spatial evidence and contact in medieval um, Scandinavia and Jonathan about the role of agency, so the role of the individual in Franco-Provençal and the sort of general French-speaking world. And after that, we're going to sum up as briefly as possible and let you uh, out into the general Q&A session after about an hour or so, a bit more. Yeah. Okay, and now this is where I hand over to the first content session and to Jonathan. Uh, thank you very much, Robin. So um, I thought I'd start as straightforwardly as possible, um, um, as I'm sure everybody in here is familiar with. Um, an off-sighted characterization of language contact is that uh, its locus is in the bilingual mind, if we take the sort of classic Weinreichian uh, definition. Um, now, if we accept, as linguists have suggested, that more than 50% of the world can be considered bi or multilingual at the very least, it's not difficult to see why contact linguistics remains a dynamic area of contemporary uh, linguistic research. Indeed, taking the long view, monolingualism might, by contrast, uh, be seen as a relatively new phenomenon, as uh, other people have argued. Uh, so characterizing, summarizing this huge field can be difficult, but broadly we can say at the very least that language contact research considers the linguistic and the sociocultural mechanisms that can lead to linguistic change. So to try and illustrate this a little bit to begin with, uh, for a more general audience, we'll consider two brief uh, illustrative examples of what I've characteristically described as contact uh, phenomena, the diffusion of metropolitan uh, across Western Europe and the development of after perfect in Irish English. And I think I'm going to start that. Uh, voila. Um, so a number of studies in language contact have looked at the spread of the R sound from metropolitan French into Western Europe in the 17th century. There's a fair amount of literature on this. Uh, originally thought to have originated in the speech of educated upper class Parisians, the variant has uh, reached, had reached Copenhagen by, we think, the late 1700s and is now pretty much standard in French, German, Danish and uh, uh, at the very least, but is found all over really. Um, it's traditionally been interpreted in terms of contact induced change, but its particular distribution has also been the subject of much commentary, particularly in the sociolinguistic literature, where it's been accepted more or less that it's a form of innovation diffusion through gradual spread. But interestingly, that diffusion took the form of the jumping of the feature uh, through major urban centers. And we might ask why that is, and we'll try and get at that question a little bit more later on as we begin to talk about our own work. For the second example on the after perfect, I'm going to hand over to Tam. Sorry, just sharing my screen quickly. Okay. So, I want to start with this um, brief uh, clip of a TV program that you might be familiar with. So, shout if this isn't working. Falling down the stairs. <laughs> what happened? Would you believe I just fell down the stairs there? What are you? Okay, so hopefully you could hear the audio there um, of this clip from Father's Head. Um, so the character says, I'm after falling down the stairs. And if you're only familiar with standard English, you might assume that what that means is that the that he's saying he wants to fall down the stairs because in standard English this construction is used to indicate a kind of a goal or an aim. If you say um, after a hot dinner you might be saying that you're hungry or looking for a restaurant. But in some varieties of English as in this one um, it has a different meaning and um, the character helpfully explains that by repeating the line with a different construction immediately afterwards. So we get I've just fallen down the stairs. So so this is often, this is called the after perfect. Um, it's a construction in which we use after, well, to be plus um, after plus a verb to indicate something which has just taken place. And it's often described as a feature of Irish English. And on the right, you can see um, a map of usage on Twitter um, in the past few years. So this is comparing different ways of expressing this meaning. 
Um, and we can see that in Irish English, it reaches up to kind of 16% of uses is with this after perfect. And it basically doesn't occur in um, England, Scotland or Wales. So it's pretty reasonable to call this a feature of Irish English specifically. And so what has this got to do with contact? Well, if we look at Irish Gaelic, we find a construction that looks remarkably similar. The way we would uh, express something like he has written a letter in standard Irish Gaelic would be literally translated something like um, he's after writing a letter. Now, it would seem a bit of a coincidence if this very similar construction existed in these two languages and uh, just by chance. Um, and indeed, if we look at the history of these languages, we can see that this was in fact a, the result of contact. So this feature first appears in Irish English sources in about the 17th century, but it occurs in Irish Gaelic sources much earlier than that. Um, we see uh, this construction, something like this construction in Irish English from about the 13th century. So this appears to be an example of structural borrowing, where even though none of the actual words from Irish Gaelic have been borrowed into English, the abstract structure of the construction and its meaning have been borrowed. Um, and so we brought it to bring this example up to show you that even in varieties that you might be familiar with, even phrases or constructions, features that might not look like um, borrowed material can in fact be due to language contact. I'll now pass on to Victoria for the last bit of this introduction. Right, now you can also hear me. That's always good. Um, I will give you a very brief overview of what, of what language contact is, um, what questions we ask, and thus what we may what you may want to watch out for when you listen to our mini research presentations later. So I'm just going to start with what is language contact vis-a-vis -vis internal evolution. Language contact basically means that languages influence each other. This can be through the import of features from another language and um, think about very prominently, prominently in a lexical domain loan words. It can be through the modification of a feature based on another language. If we just take a lexical example, again, this word by word copying in something like skyscraper um, uh, modeled on Wolkenkratzer in German. And it could be through the strengthening of an existing feature due to a parallel in another language. Um, there's research, for example, on parataxis becoming more common in German under the influence of English. In essence, a change in the language is effected through contact with another language rather than through organic development. So not something like we are, we've lost our declensional endings in English and we've got some remnants in pronouns, but you rather have a language, another language impacting. Second question is what areas of a language are affected by language contact? In theory, that can be really every area of a language, including its phonology, its morphology, its syntax. Um, we've already had some lexical examples, etc. In reality, lexical and phonological features draw certainly most attention to themselves. Um, we've already mentioned loan words and phonologically you could think of accents. Question number three, so what effect does language contact have on a language? Well, language contact can have a lasting effect, in which case a contact variety may develop. Think, for example, of pigeons that were created in colonial settings in order to communicate. And if these mixed languages then stick around, they become creoles and the first language of some speakers. But language contact can also be sporadic in that bilingual individuals or small groups of language users demonstrate contact phenomena interferences which are not adopted by the larger group of speakers. So how do we then know it is language contact and only language contact? So our usual pattern of thought is to identify a feature of interest and its ancestors as it were. And if these ancestors are from only one language, we would assume that internal development has changed the shape of the feature over time. But if these ancestors are from several languages, we would consider language contact. However, we must then really carefully check um, that the feature in question does not exist in any older variety of our language, not in any non-standard variety in literary registers, etc. 
Often we actually cannot prove that language contact alone underlies a feature, but a multiplicity of factors, including the genre register, its location, etc., um, of the attestations of the feature are relevant. And I think that will become quite or is quite nicely illustrated by our mini research presentations later. So what are we interested in about a contact scenario? Well, so if we decide that language contact is a plausible aspect to consider, we can approach the description of our scenario from different angles. Um, to give you a few examples, sociolinguists would be interested in language users and channels of communication, as this is how contact features develop and spread. Structuralist approaches would be more interested in the structural characteristics of the feature in question and common path of development. Dialectologists will, will rather consider the spatial setting of contact features, and these are really just a few approaches to language contact. We basically, we choose an approach and more a model of language contact based on our research question and the data we have available. And finally, last but not least, where do we actually find information? So for modern uh, languages, we can do large scale studies with native speakers or bilinguals, depending on our research interests, as um, Jonathan, I think, is going to show us. Um, for corpus languages, we rather draw on preserved texts, as Robin and I will show you. These can be literary or non-literary. They can be preserved on a range of materials, including, for example, something like papyrus, parchment, stone, later on paper, etc. Um, there's a world of difference between texts relating to official contexts, such as the legal sphere, or private contexts, such as personal messages. And large corpora of texts can, of course, also be used for modern languages, as Tamsin is, in particular is going to show us. And I think with this, I am going to hand over to back to Robin. That's right. OK, so I think you should now see my screen again. And I'm going to talk to you about alignment change through contact. So how we are going to get through very different structural features in one particular language by means of language contact. And the language I'm going to talk to you about is classical Armenian and Parthian, an Iranian language. So let me set the scene for you. We are in the fifth century AD, um, more or less. This is when the Armenian language is first attested in writing through inscriptions and later on through manuscripts that are dating from this time. And what we're talking about and what's to come is very much based on histori historiographic te texts from this fifth century AD. So Armenian is an independent branch of the Indo-European language family, but you wouldn't know that just looking at it because, and this is what we have thought until the end of the 19th century, it looks like an Iranian language, largely because of its lexicon, which has been very heavily influenced chiefly by Parthian, which is a Northwest Middle Iranian language, a mouthful I know. So how can we tell this influence? Well, as I said, the lexicon is soaked through with Parthian effectively. Um, one study suggests that more than 30% of the basic lexicon are of Iranian origin. But we also see elements of Iranian phonology, some derivation of morphology, and syntax in there. And this is the latter part that I want to talk to you about, the syntax. And we'll see a couple of features, but we'll concentrate on one very particular one. So why um, do we think that contact is involved? Well, as I said, we've got some elements that are very, very clear and obvious, like lexicon and phonology, but we also have extra linguistic evidence. And this is very important for establishing a good and clear picture of what's going on. Iranian languages have been in contact with and influencing Irani uh, Armenian for about a thousand years, to an extent because Iranians have been ruling Armenia for that period of time. And just to let you know, the area of Armenia that we're talking about is more or less the red area in the right-hand side map. And the greatest influence that we see um, is in the period of Parthian rule, so from the middle of the first century AD until the middle of the fifth century AD, when the Parthians are the ruling class of Armenia and at some point also in, involve a hereditary dynasty um, that rules this country. Now, um, what we're going to talk about in particular is structural borings and a kind of pattern replication in Armenian, whereby the Armenian language has adopted uh, and slightly adapted patterns, so that are structures, constructions uh, from Parthian into its own language. And there is a couple of smaller examples that I've given here to you just for exemplification's sake. So things like intensifiers and anaphoras, reflexive and complementizer users. 
that um, on their own don't look particularly fascinating, but if you look at how exactly they work and see that they're on the whole a little peculiar, but are peculiar in both of these languages, so in Armenian and in Iranian, that very strongly suggests contact, and I can go into the details when we have the Q&A session, if you like. But the main pattern that I want to talk to you about is the periphrastic perfect. Now, you all know what periphrastic, periphrastic perfects are because most of you will have them in your language. We have them in English. I, I have read a book in German, ich habe ein Buch gelesen, in French, uh, j'ai lu un livre, etc. All of these consist of a participle and some sort of auxiliary verb. And the interesting part is um, how in this perfect we find a particular kind of alignment agreement pattern. Now, Armenian, like most of the languages we speak in Western Europe and like most in European languages, has a nominative accusative alignment pattern, whereby the subject of an intransitive verb, so I run, and the agent of a transitive verb, so I pet the dog, um, are marked in the same way. They receive the same case, they might be in the same position, they have verb agreement, etc. Whilst an object, so the dog and the petting example, is marked differently as accusative, final position in the sentence, etc. And um, we can normally differentiate between subject and agent on the one hand and object on the other hand by seeing that you know, a sentence like Julia pets the dog is not the same as the pet dog pets Julia, right? But, and here comes the problem and the crux of my point, um, there are some languages in the European language family and elsewhere that have another kind of alignment pattern, namely ergative absolutive, where it isn't the subject and the agent, so the people who do things, who run, who pet, um, but the subject and the object who share the same type of marking, either position, agreement, um, case marking, etc. And the interesting part is that in some languages we find both patterns. Now, pardon. In Armenian, the case is the following. Um, we have something called tense sensitive alignment split, meaning that in the present and other synthetic tenses, like the imperfect and the errors, we find the nominative and accusative alignment pattern that we're used to from the languages spoken in Western Europe that are very, very standard for our Western perspective, where the subject and agent are marked as nominative, whilst the object is marked as accusative. So far, so unproblematic. Now, in the perfect, which again consists of a participle and sometimes a auxiliary verb, uh, the situation is slightly differently because there historically, the analysis is such that the agent is marked differently, namely as genitive. The genitive also marks possession and appurtenance, whilst the subject and the object receive the same case um, here designated as nominative and accusative. So we have an alignment split between nominative accusative type in the present and other synthetic tenses and ergative absolutive in the analytical tenses. But there are a couple of problems, otherwise I wouldn't be talking to you. Uh, first of all, the nominative isn't always the same as the accusative. And that makes an enormous difference if we're talking about alignment patterns. And the second point is that you know, the historical analysis that we find in the works that I've given to you in red at the bottom often don't take into account or can't explain all of the data that we see even in these very earliest texts. Now, um, what does that mean for our language contact purposes? Well, it means that maybe internal analyses as such as these are at the bottom um, aren't um, the key to our question, so the answer to how did this pattern of alignment, split alignment in Armenian arise? Because what we're actually dealing with isn't ergative absolutive alignment and split with nominative accusative, but a tripartite type of alignment. Because we can differentiate the object and the subject either through case marking, because nominative and accusative can very often be differentiated. It's just a couple of categories like nominate uh, nouns in the singular that cannot uh, make this difference. And even if we can't do it by case ending, we can do it syntactically through proclitics, which differentiate, for instance, definite and indefinite or individualized and non-individualized objects. There's also a point of verb agreement, but that gets a little uh, complicated. So ask me in the aftermath, if you like. So res the result of this analysis, if we take into account all the factors, is that we actually find that the so-called ergative absolutive analysis is a minority pattern or a misanalysis, if you like, and what we find is tripartite alignment. So where subject is marked as nominative, object as accusative, and agent as genitive. This kind of alignment, tri tripartite, is neither economical, because no, there's no good reason to mark all of these three arguments differently, it's rarely stable on a comparative basis, so most languages that have it develop away from it. 
And when we find it, it is very often a sign of transition or of a change in progress between one or the other common alignment pattern, so between nominative, accusative, and locative, and absolutive. What does that mean? So I've given you a couple of examples here just to illustrate what that looks like. In Armenian, um, you will always see in both one and two that the blue constituents are the agents, so in the genitive, voro in the first example, noda in the second, whilst in number one, you've got a clearly marked accusative plural, nishanagdiris, and in number two, you've got a um, opaque nominative or accusative, which might then be interpreted as a quasi ergative absolutive alignment, and maybe is a sign of the origin of this pattern. More problematically, however, we also find at this very early time period, so in the very earliest century of attestation of Armenian, that there are other patterns beyond what I've just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So that both, that the perfect also shows instances of nominative accusative alignment, where either the subject is marked as genitive, so like an agent, or the agent is marked like a subject, a nominative, pointing at the fact that, again, this system is not stable. And it suggests the hypothesis that maybe what we're dealing with is an alignment shift from original and not properly attested ergative absolutive to the majority type in our earliest documents, tripartite, and then by the end of the 8th century or so, nominative accusative pattern, which are already predicted by these incidences of non-standard patterns here. Now, what the heck has this got to do with language contact? Very clearly, Parthian has a very similar pattern. Parthian also shows split alignment. So we find the present and other tenses like that showing nominative accusative patterns, but the past tense, which again is based on a participle, which again uses very frequently a, uh, a copula, so an auxiliary verb, showing ergative absolutive alignment. And again, I've given you an example here. In number three, you can see again in blue, the agent marked as oblique, <clears throat> which is normally the pattern we expect for the object. And um, also agreement with uh, the object of the sentence. So he left me an orphan, where the verb is first person singular, as well as, as the direct object. But you also say, see in number four, types where there is no finite verb. So what does this have to do with Armenian? Well, given how much contact we've seen in other domains of linguistics, so in phonology, lexicon, etc., it's um, not too far-fetched to assume that maybe contact is a possible vector uh, for this uh, construction to have arisen. And because of the commonalities, so the use of participles, the tense split, the problems with the copula, which we can get into, into later, the possibility of differentiating objects by means of syntax, etc., cetera, um, it stands the reason that what has happened is a case of pattern replication where the path in past tense has been, in inverted commas, copied. So the pivot of the participle has been taken as the butt of the construction and then copied into Armenian. And over time, the original ergative absolutive pattern has been modified to better match the requirements of the Armenian language, possibly under the stresses of the other tenses, which require nominative accusative alignment. And so what we end up with is a compromise, a mixed pattern like tripartite. And in the end, through the pressure of, for instance, the present, a nominative accusative alignment. And again, I'm happy to explain the details later. Now, what does this tell us um, more generally? Well, it suggests one thing. Um, this kind of pattern replication of structural interaction doesn't just happen uh, willy-nilly, because it requires intensive and extensive language contact. And um, so we have to take into account some extra linguistic data. One of that, one of these elements is the death of Parthian, or as I call it, the first death of Parthian in that region, because we don't actually find any Parthian documents in that time period anymore. And that suggests in a combination with some other factors like the sort of identification ideologically between Armenians and the Parthians, the common Christianization of these two peoples, that the Parthian rulers have actually abandoned their own language in favor of Armenian and have thus adopted Armenian. And because of their use of the language, having developed, having included some of their own L1 patterns, so of Parthian patterns in Armenian, their variety, their acrylect was viewed as particularly prestigious and thus imitated and became the dominant language of the region, including this perfect tense pattern. 
There are similar things that happen uh, elsewhere. So in Norman French, we've had a similar super straight shift where the ruling class has um, originally spoken French, but then adopted English because it seemed like a good idea after the Norman, in the centuries after the Norman conquest. And we find similar imports or changes to um, alignment patterns in other languages in contact with uh, Iranian languages. So for instance, in Northeastern Neo-Aramaic in contact with Kurdish varieties. Now, what are the takeaways from this presentation, which is inevitably you know, very condensed and doesn't go into much detail? Well, our data is very limited because we're dealing with corpus language, right? So we can't go back in time and ask, so what do you say, what do you say? Meaning we have to rely on what data we have and on the extra linguistic evidence to make sure that we don't talk nonsense. It also allows us um, to gain new insights into um, these languages that we study if we take into account the potential of language contact, especially when internal evidence hasn't shed enough light. And it also shows that maybe even when something like a super straight shift is uncommon, that doesn't necessarily mean that it is impossible given the right linguistic and extra linguistic data. And for our Iranian, Iranian and Armenian, it solves a number of problems as I've outlined there. And if you like, at the end, we can talk about the specifics of how these kind of shifts work by using the right hand figure that I've given you here. And at this point, I shut up and leave you to, into the good hands of Victoria. This time you can already hear me, so we're making progress. Um, right, so we're going to go a bit further back in time and away from the ruling elite and to some everyday people. So what I basically want to show you um, is an example of a structure that is non-standard from the perspective of the standard language as outlined in grammar books. A structure that does, however, has predecessors and parallels in its language and a structure that spreads most likely due to language contact more widely into other areas of the language. So basically, I'm not looking at a feature that was generated by language contact, but rather one where we have several factors interacting. Overall, I'm applying a sociolinguistic framework to my analysis, meaning I'm primarily interested in how language usage maps on different domains of life. And I kind of conceptualize the speaker as the pl place where language contact takes place. So I'm going to take you, as you can see from the slide already, um, to Egypt in the about fourth to seventh centuries. At this time, Greek speakers had been present for about a millennium and Greek had gained the status of an official language, first under the Ptolemaic kings who ruled Egypt from the third century BC onwards and then under the Roman emperors who ruled Egypt from the first century BC onwards. However, the native language Egyptian was still widely used and actually got just before the fourth century a nice new writing system, the Coptic alphabet. And the name of this script gives away why we are going to call Egyptian Coptic in this period of, of time. So Coptic is not a new language, it's not a different language, it is still the same language Egyptian just at a later point in time when we use the Coptic alphabet to write it. Now on the slide you have a lovely map of Egypt and due to the very wet delta region where papyri did sadly not survive, we are mostly going to talk about texts that come from somewhere in the middle of the country. You also have a Greek letter and an early Coptic school book exercise on the slide. So letter, Greek letter on the left, um, early Coptic school book exercise on the right. So we're not going to talk about literature, but about documentary texts. The feature we are interested in is dubbed insubordination. Insubordination means that a structurally dependent clause comes to function as an independent clause. And I've put two nice examples on the slide. The first is German and here insubordination is clear from the intonation pattern. We have a pause after obwohl and the word order pattern, which is verb second here. Neither of these two things should happen in a proper subordinate clause. The second example is French, and here we use the subordinator see if in an independent clause in order to convey a wish, a wish. And if you look at the English translation, we're actually doing pretty much the same in English too. 
Now, we're not going to talk about German or French, but about Greek. So here are the two or the first of the two insubordinate patterns we are going to think about. So we have got hoti, which heads complementary that clauses in Greek, for example, after verbs of saying, as in my standard example in the nice gray box at the top. So he said that he had come. Now, the way we know that this is a subordinate clause is that if you compare the direct statement, something like I have now come, and the indirect statement with that, you notice that we have to adjust the tense, personal ending of the verb, any deictic pronouns. And if we are in a historic sequence in Greek, so if we have something like we, um, if we have something like he said rather than he is saying before the that clause, um, we can even switch the mood of the verb around. Now, all of this, um, Plato does actually not do when he uses Hoti in his Gorgias. Um, that is a literary work um, in the form of a dialogue. So in my passage, in the passage on the slide, you actually have two interesting instances, one at the very beginning and one before the passage I highlighted in red in order to make it easier for you to spot. Um, in neither case, Hoti is behaving as we would expect it to. Candidate number two. Um, is hina, which usually heads a purpose clause, as in my example here, again, in my nice gray box. So he came in order that he may help his brother. I know I'm very, not very creative about the standard examples. Now, the way we know that this is a dependent clause is basically the same as I've already described before. If you go from an independent clause expressing a purpose, something along the lines of I intend to help your brother or so, to the purpose clause you have here, we need to adjust the personal ending of the verb, the tense, the mood of the verb in historic sequence. Again, that's kind of optional in Greek. So again, we are just thinking about, do we have something like he came versus he is coming before the purpose clause? And we have to adjust any deictic pronouns and adverbs. Additionally, purpose clauses usually follow verbs of movement, sending, etc. You get the idea. However, um, at the bottom of the slide, you have an unruly example from one of our papyrus letters. Um, Hina here appears in a command that is parallel to the preceding command. And our papyrus letters are non-literary, documentary, and this one dates from the fourth century. Now, I called our in our clause above um, or on the slide before unruly and that's certainly the wrong word to use as I want to show you. So these insubordinate structures are actually not syntax gone wrong sort of but rather serve specific functions and purposes and this slide here is very selective. I obviously picked like the stellar examples that make it easy to explain for me. So the first example we've already seen, now here I contrast our insubordinate structure with the proper subordinate structure, so a structure where you don't have a pause after a wall and you have a nice verb final, um, which you should have. And you see in the English translation that this changes the meaning. So roughly translated, I get to something like actually um, with the insubordinate structure and although in the subordinate one. So these two structures are not equivalent, but have actually different meanings. Example two, we have hinted at above already. So like in French, you can use if in wishes in English, um, if only I knew how to explain this well, um, sentence chosen on purpose. Um, that is very different from using if to introduce a condition, um, if what I did in the second sentence. So here we have these two different structures serve very different purposes. And example three, I added, added because it shows that this insubordinate structure functions at a whole different level vis-a-vis -vis our subordinate structure. So here we indicate what function this has in the discourse. Um, so k can head clauses introducing a justification, commentary, conclusion, or opposition. Obviously here um, you have k flagging an opposition. This is more about pragmatic properties and then about morphosyntactic. Now, you know what languages we are interested in, Greek and Coptic, you know what phenomenon we are interested in, insubordination with Hoti and Hina. So it's time to think about how these insubordinate structures actually came about. We're going to approach the emergence of these features from a sociolinguistic perspective, as I said before already. So that is, we are interested in domains of language usage. Languages are usually used in different domains, such as people's personal life, the public life, the legal sphere, um, or politics um, in any society you could add to that list. Um, for Greek and Coptic, we have initially a rather clear divide. So Greek is used in public and official functions and Coptic in the private sphere. 
Now, the idea is that when a feature originates in this private, informal, colloquial, etc., domain of language usage, that it can spread more widely when it is accepted in other domains. That would be a bottom up change. Alternatively, a feature could be popular in literary texts and gradually kind of infiltrate colloquial speech or other domains of language usage, and that would be a top down change. So where do our two structures with Hoti and Hina respectively then originate and does language contact play a role? Well, it has to, otherwise they would probably have kicked me off, have kicked me off this panel, but just to keep the tension. Um, so in order to answer this question, we are going to look at parallels. Um, I just started, you could have started with any, I just started with liter uh, literary parallels. So Hoti we call that Hoti Recitativum, already appears in classical literature. I have the example from the Gorgias and also appears in the New Testament. So that insubordinate structure actually has a nice literary parallel. Hina as a wish um, request command particle does not exist in classical literature, nor does it in the New Testament. So we've got a nice literary ancestor for Hoti, but not for Hina. Now, if we look at the contact language, um, as I say, it has something, it must have something to do with language contact, right? So we Coptic does not may have a morphosyntactically marked differentiation between dependent and independent clauses. Um, it's not a tiny bit like English. So we could assume that using a subordinator with an independent clause pattern was just a slip of the tongue or rather pen, and someone just got it wrong. Yet for that, our structures are actually too common and as we've seen, do have very specific functions and purposes. If we look a bit further, um, Coptic does have a structure Jacus plus future three, so um, which is partly used in purpose clauses um, and the future three is a, a modal form, very generally speaking. And Coptic does make a clear distinction between direct and indirect speech, if you remember our that clauses at the beginning. So we've got a parallel for Hina here, our Jacas plus future three, but we don't have one for Hoti um, because that, yeah, there's nothing that we could plausibly draw on as a parallel. And then I looked at similar structures in Greek. Um, is there anything that we are kind of maybe overlooking? So hoppos with a future indicative appears actually in emphatic exhortations, warnings, etc., in classical literature already. Hoppos and Hina are often considered like a bit they're very similar, similar function, they appear in purpose clauses, etc. So this is a nice um, parallel. So we've got a parallel structure here for Hina, um, but overall this is not a very clear picture and that is to be expected as I told you at the very beginning of this talk when I ran you through the um, research questions. So from what we've just seen, we have to ask ourselves whether language contact alone can have caused these insubordinate structures. And the most likely answer is no, given that I've already told you that we have a nice literary ancestor for Hoti and that we have a nice parallel in Greek for Hina. However, what language contact may explain is the explosive spread of these structures in post-classical Greek. And this is why we're going to look at use patterns. So a use pattern is very generally speaking, the distribution of grammatical and idiomatic features across genres, registers, speakers, and texts. And now surprise, surprise, there are minor and major use patterns. Minor use patterns can become major use patterns under the influence of a second language. Um, in that case, they increase in frequency, um, they can usually get extended to new contexts, and they assume new meanings. Now that fits our picture quite well with our insubordinate structures, not so much the hoty ones, but at least the Hina ones. Um, I did not give you any statistics because these are quite complex due to all the parameters that impact and you can't be all things to all people in like what 13 minutes. So you will just have to believe me that Hina is still comparatively less common than Hoti and insubordinate structures in our papyrus letters. However, it is really a bit too common to count as bilingual interference that would be as one person drawing on two languages when phrasing what they want to say. So where does this all leave us? Now, Hoti, we said, exists in classical and post-classical literature, does not really have a, cop um, a Coptic parallel. Um, so we've, we kind of would, um, we've seen that this one has a parallel only in so far as Coptic does not distinguish between dependent and independent clauses morphosyntactically. Um, given that it already exists in literature, um, we would say that is most likely a top-down change. So that is kind of um, adopted in like more um, colloquial registers. 
And Hina does not exist in classical literature, um, nor does it in post-classical, actually. I could have put that on the slide, sorry. Um, does have a nice Coptic parallel. Um, appears primarily in non-literary, non-official texts. Um, is it, as I say, it's not quite as common as Hoti. Um, and this change, so that would be a bottom-up change. So you have something starting in like the more colloquial, informal context, and then slides slowly spreading, not yet into literary registers, obviously. And this change was most likely accelerated by the Coptic parallel, and thus by language contact. So see, I don't have to get kicked off this panel. Um, I managed to get it in somewhere. Um, so I say kind of it is only accelerated because do remember there was a Greek parallel, the hopos plus future constructions and independent clauses. And with this, I am handing over to Tom. Thanks, Victoria. I'll just share this. Okay, great. Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about is a method of trying to distinguish whether a change that we see in the history of a language really should be thought of as the result of contact or not. And this is something that both, um, both Victoria and Robin have touched on effectively already. Um, and they've mostly, not entirely, but mostly used what we call internal evidence to decide whether something should be regarded as uh, a contact feature or not. So if we find a feature in, um, in one language, another language in contact with it gains that feature and it's quite a distinctive feature, then it would be a bit of a coincidence if that wasn't the result of contact. And that's the kind of the way internal evidence would work. But sometimes we get cases where it's hard to tell whether we really should regard a change as being the result of contact or not. And one class of such, um, of such changes are simplifying changes. So what I mean by this are changes which um, result in the grammar becoming simpler in some way. So this could mean where uh, many similar sounds are distinguished in the phonology and the pronunciation before and that and some of those are merged so that the resulting system of pronunciation is simpler. It could be where we have kind of complex morphological systems, so lots of parts of verbs or nouns which um, are used in different syntactic contexts and those are reduced so that uh, the number of different contexts distinguish becomes smaller or it could be irregularities um, which are regularized out so all of those would be examples of simplifying changes now there's two different ways that those could be the result of contact in principle they could be direct borrowing so it could be that we have um, one language borrows some feature from another or we should say the speakers of one language borrow a structure from another um, and as it happens, that new feature is simpler than whatever it replaces. And so the overall result is a simplifying change. But we can also have this kind of change resulting without direct borrowing being involved at all. And this is from the work of people like Peter Truggill, Eston Dahl, and John McWhorter, um, who look at the effect of uh, situations where we have a large number of second language learners in the population. So this builds on very kind of well-established fact in linguistics, which is that uh, adults are quite bad at learning languages. Um, children, by contrast, are very good at learning languages, but when adults learn languages as second languages for the first time, they tend to simplify the grammar in some ways. They maybe only make subtle distinctions that native speakers always make um, inconsistently, or they maybe uh, regularize out some of the irregularities. And if we have enough second language speakers in the population, those simplified features can potentially sometimes spread um, out to native speakers. And so we can have these changes that result from contact without the features of the language in contact um, actually being relevant. It's not actually a matter of features borrowing, but just um, imperfect second language learning. So that's two ways in which these simplifying changes could result from contact. But the thing is, these changes are also what we call very natural changes. They're the kinds of changes which can happen spontaneously very easily. So internal, i.e. internal change, which means change without an external, without a contact cause, is also always perfectly likely. So we have this problem of how do we distinguish? If we have some historical case where a change like this has happened and contact explanations are possible, how do we know whether they're the right explanations? So as has already been said, contact is not really between languages, really it's between speakers of different languages. And as a result, it's always going to be concentrated in particular 
social groups and particular places. So it might be concentrated in um, a particularly mobile subpopulation, um, say merchants or traders or members of uh, higher socio socioeconomic classes who travel more and so come into contact with other languages, or it might be concentrated in geographical locations where the populations of speakers of different languages overlap. Now, if we think that it's possible that a change is the result of contact, well, then that actually entails a prediction, which is that it should have started in the places and the subpopulations where that contact was taking place. And I'm going to tr talk you through an example um, of using that kind of way of testing this hypothesis uh, in medieval Norwegian. So medieval Norwegian is a good uh, case study to look at because um, it's just a very it's a very clear kind of sociolinguistic situation. We have um, two different or maybe three different contact scenarios going on which are relevant. We have contact with Danish because um, the initially the church and later the state as well uh, was um, uh, based in Denmark. So we have contact with Danish speakers mostly in kind of uh, urban centers. But we also have contact with low German um, so in this period, I'm talking about the kind of uh, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, um, the, one of the major powers in this region was the Hanseatic League. So for anyone who doesn't know this bit of history, the Hanseatic League is um, a kind of state-like power. It is a, an alliance of trading city-states, and they have uh, major trading outposts throughout Scandinavia. And as a result, there are many low German speakers in Norway. So here's a map just to give you an idea of the geography if you're not familiar with the geography of Norway. The major cities are Trundheim in the northern part of this map, um, Bergen and Stavanger on the west coast, Oslo and Hamar in the east, and we've got larger towns like Sheen and Tunsberg. And the three red points here are the locations of um, Hans Hansa presences. So these are cities where there was a significant population of Middle Low German speakers. And that especially applies to Bergen, where maybe up to 40% of the population um, were adult Middle Low German speakers who arrived as adults in Norway, and so would only be second language speakers of Norwegian. Now, lots of changes that we could broadly describe as simplifying changes happen in the grammar of Norwegian in this period. And I'm not going to, and I have looked at a number of them and I can talk about more in the questions if anyone's interested, but I'm only going to look at one here. But the reason I bring up the fact that there are lots of these is that if you read a history of Norwegian, a kind of broad history of the language, you'll get the impression that um, there was lots of simplifying change in this period and that it was a result of contact with Middle Low German. And that's, yeah, that's the thing I want to test. So the particular change I'm going to look at here is a change in verb morphology in the first person plural. So in, and this is all a bit simplified, but for the purposes of this talk, in Old Norwegian, we have a distinctive first person plural verbal ending, which is something like um. um we have a distinctive third person plural verbal ending, which is something like u. Uh. But in specific word orders, so when you have a sequence of verb immediately followed by a subject pronoun, um, you can actually, in the first person plural, you can actually have either ending. So there's this slightly kind of complicated system. And then in Middle Norwegian, a little bit later than this, um, we just get a single ending, which looks like the older third person plural ending in all of these contexts. So regardless of the word order and regardless of person. So this is clearly a simplifying change. We start out with a somewhat more complex system and we end up with a simpler one. And it could perfectly well be a kind of natural internal development. In other words, a spontaneous change where this, um, place of kind of overlap in the grammar where we get both endings in a specific word order. We could just have that pattern spreading, the kind of constraints on it breaking down, and so we end up with a simpler system with just one ending in all contexts. That would be a very natural kind of expected change. But this could also be a borrowed pattern from Middle Low German. So Middle Low German um, had just one ending in the plural, so from the point of view of Norwegian speakers, the ending of the first and third person plural in Middle Low German was the same. So we could have had just structural borrowing pattern replication of that, um, that relationship between the first and third person plural. Uh, so it could just be, this could be a borrowed pattern. 
Alternatively, this could be the result of intensive contact. This could be that kind of simplification I mentioned by adult second language learners. So it might be that our handsome merchants who arrive in Bergen in their teens already effectively from a linguistic point of view, adult speakers and have to learn Norwegian, just don't really get the hang of or don't always get the hang of this um, agreement system. And eventually their simplified system spreads to um, native Norwegian speakers. Or finally, it could have been borrowed from Danish because the, exactly the same change had already happened in Danish. So all of those four explanations are perfectly plausible and it isn't really possible to distinguish between them just from linguistic evidence. However, they do make spatial predictions. So if this was due to, if this change was due to contact with Danish, it should have started in the cities because that's where our Danish speakers were mostly located. And that's where the kind of the power centers of the church and state were. If this was due to contact with Low German, it should also have started in the cities, but really specifically Bergen, Oslo or Tansberg, and actually really specifically Bergen, because that's where by far the largest number of Middle Low German speakers were. If it was an internal development, on, on the other hand, it could pretty much have happened anywhere. So the data I'm going to use to test this is um, about 10,500 charters, so um, legal documents. We've got an, an example of a charter here. Um, I found, I think, pretty much all of the first person plural verbs in them, which is about 24,000 verbs in about 5,800 of these documents. This is then what the change looks like in time. Um, the yellow line here, this is our old Norwegian ending, this is the um. um the red line is the change that we're interested in coming in, and you can see that that starts to increase around the beginning of the 15th century. It's really rapidly increasing in the early 16th century. And then the black line is an unrelated change, which kind of gets in the way. We're not very interested in that. Um, so we're just really interested in this red line replacing the yellow. So in order to look at the spatial evidence, we need to actually locate all these texts, which I have done. But the problem with this is that um, the data are very noisy. And by that, I mean, I'm probably wrong a great deal of the time about where these texts are actually from. It's quite hard to work out where we should assign the language of medieval texts to. So if you were to just map these as they are, um, you would just see chaos, you'd see something that looks like white noise. And so I've used some statistical, statistical methods here to kind of smooth out that and try and uncover the underlying patterns. That's actually kind of the largest bit of work I've done and I can talk about that in the questions, but I'm assuming that that's not the kind of primary thing of interest here. So the maps I'm gonna show you are the result of that. So here's our results. Going left to right, we're moving in 50 year increments starting in 1400, the whiter and bluer dots are places where the change hasn't happened yet. The darker and redder dots are where it's more advanced. So in 1400 you can see we just see the first inklings of this change in two places basically in Norway, in Trondheim and in Bergen. Then as the change progresses in 1450 we start to see it in the east as well, in Hamar inland here and in Oslo. And basically that pattern then just intensifies from then on. So that by the end of the period, those cities are still the most far ahead, but we have the changes spread outwards from them. And we've really just got this inland area here in Telemark in the south, which is the kind of leftover place where we get sometimes get the old, um, old Norwegian endings. So what does this mean for our hypotheses? Well, the cities lead this change and it arises earliest in Bergen and Trondheim. And throughout it, uh, Bergen, Trondheim, Oslo and Hamar lead. And I think that strongly points towards Danish contact being the right explanation. So the, the leading positions of Oslo and Bergen fit the idea that this is contact with Middle Low German, but Trondheim and Hamar being leading localities for this change really doesn't make much sense if this was contact with Low German, because there weren't any Low German speakers, well, there weren't very many Low German speakers there. Especially the fact that Trondheim is the place we see this arise earliest really makes it difficult to um, fit this to the explanation that this is due to low German contact. Whereas our Danish speakers, are, our Danish contact is happening in all of the cities. Now almost any pattern, as I said, could be consistent with this being a spontaneous internal development. But the fact that this arises in multiple cities simultaneously um, would make, that would be a bit of a coincidence if this was just an internal thing. We'd kind of expect it to happen in just one place. Whereas if it's due to 
some external phenomenon which is located in multiple cities simultaneously, like contact with another language, then we can make rather more sense of that, that, um, that pattern. So the takeaways here, um, it's often hard to distinguish between contact effects and uh, internal developments, but we can use the fact that contact really is something between speakers and speakers have to be located somewhere in space to, um, to tease out the evidence. And I want to uh, kind of point I want to make with this is that we might often want to infer from a big picture, like lots of simplifying change happened and there was contact with Middle Low German down to individual cases. But it's actually worth going into the individual cases and looking, because it might turn out that the evidence um, is a little, it points towards something slightly different. All right, that's all from me. So I'll now pass over to Jonathan. Um, right. So, um, as we've seen then, language contact has been invoked um, in explanations of linguistic change. Linguists can address these changes using historical data with lots of, lots of time depth, as we've seen. Uh, we can also address, this ling um, address linguistic change synchronically using data collected from speakers in the present. Now, the benefits here are that uh, we can actually talk to people about how they evaluate their language. And this is important because the way people evaluate and act on these evaluations can be a significant predictor of linguistic change in of itself. And I'm gonna try and illustrate that as best I can with the tiny bit of time that I've got. So, um, yeah, so sociolinguistics and the particular branch of sociolinguistics that, that I work in, uh, which explores the relationship between language structure and society, continues to debate whether or not identity is primary or secondary to linguistic change, um, as the papers such as Peter Drugger and Molly Babel have pointed out. Um, in, in other words, whether we consciously or unconsciously drive linguistic change through processes such as accommodation to others, um, you know, the extent to which uh, we want to be more like the individuals that we are in conversation with. And we know that obviously, Accommodation in the short term can lead to things like phenomena like borrowings, which over time can lead to long term change. So there's a sort of open debate about the extent to which that is uh, an automatic process or not still, or whether it's more of an agentive process. What we're reasonably confident of, though, is that language attitudes can play a pivotal role in uh, mediating which features win out over time. They can promote change. They can reverse, override, inhibit changes in progress. Um, Indeed, it has even been suggested that language change may simply reflect changes in interlocutor frequencies, which are in turn the result of changes in social preferences um, and attitudes, underscoring just how important it is to consider agency among speakers in uh, understanding outcomes of, um, of language contact. And to best get at this relationship, my particular branch of uh, sociolinguistics, the, the one I tend to work in, looks to those features of language which seem to vary freely of the sorts of categorical rules that linguists have traditionally at least preferred to build theories around. Uh, consider, for example, um, the spread of glottal stops in British English or um, um, the particle ne deletion in uh, French negation. Uh, when it comes to these sorts of features, we tend to ask questions like, what exactly is variable? Uh, how is that variation linguistically constrained? Or how is the variation embedded in uh, social structure? Um, and assessing how a feature is socially embedded requires understanding how communities evaluate that, uh, that, um, that, that variation. This is because studies since the late 60s at least now have shown us that such features can be sensitive to our attitudes and uh, further can constrain the variation um, uh, when, we are, when, when we are aware of that variation. If there's some metalinguistic evaluation pegged to it, then it, it can be um, controlled to some extent by speakers. So just a classic example of this from David Sankoff and Pierre Thibault's work, uh, which looked at uh, Montreal French, where you have this interesting variable phenomena in the use of avoir and être with verbs of movement, uh, in this particular case, tomber. And in their data, what they were broadly able to show was that not only did 
um, whether or not one uses avoir ou être or with tomber, uh, correlates to a greater or lesser extent with uh, the kind of social background of the speaker, what kind of uh, class background they belong to, how much education they've had, uh, and so on. But it also um, correlated somewhat with um, their attitudes towards uh, language in general. So a question such as, how important is it to have a master of standard or legitimized or a legitimized variety of the language? You can see here a neat uh, intersection of the two variants on the chart where Je suis tombé moves up the social ladder and in approval of, uh, uh, of valuing uh, standard features and you find the opposite effect with j'ai tombé, obviously. Um, this feature is widely attributed at least to contact in, in uh, the classic literature. So our attitudes, our ideologies towards uh, language very much matter here. Uh, and this is a, a sort of staple of the, uh, of the variationist enterprise. Um, now, in my own work, I, I consider how these sorts of principles operate when applied to uh, endangered language contexts of which Franco-Provençal is one. Uh, Franco-Provençal is uh, very much a civilian endangered language now, probably spoken by much less than 0.1% of the total regional population in Western Europe, where it's still found. Um, it's been in long-term contact with uh, French and Italian uh, and speakers uh, that were once raised, you know, at a time monolingually are now sequentially bilingual and dominant in a language other than Franco-Provençal. And uh, for the French speakers in the room, I just wanted to highlight just how different from uh, French at least these varieties are. Hopefully you can hear this. Uh, do shout, Hannah, if these don't make, if these don't play. It's lots of sleep. La bise et le soleil s'ingolent, choquant à et en calette le plus faux. Quand y vivent un voyageux que ça d'useux, un pacteau dans son manteau. Okay, yeah, hopefully you could hear that. Um, so that was uh, a speaker from Quaz um, in the uh, Mont du Lyonnais region on the French side of the border. And the next speaker is uh, from Nanda. Uh, in the canton of Valais in Switzerland. Uh, I'm not sure if that played. Okay, so for the French speakers, French speakers in the room at least, pretty pretty different from French. So the, in, in many ways, Franco Provencal as a name is a, is a bit of an issue uh, in of itself. So in, on the French and Swiss sides of the border, at least where I've tended to conduct my field work, uh, intergenerational transmission uh, no longer really takes place and speakers are progressively uh, but surely shifting towards uh, French. Uh, and in these sorts of contexts, the literature has demonstrated to us for some time that we can expect a lot of variation uh, in the linguistic system, uh, much of which can be attributed to contact, such as, um, such as for example, simplification that Tam has already uh, talked about. Um, so while the language is, you know, regrettably in terminal decline, uh, there are, I would add, a younger, more militant group of learners who are trying to keep the language from the precipice, if we like, um, and uh, I'll return to them uh, in a little while. For now, though, it's probably worth just me highlighting that um, in my work, I've tended to approach research questions that uh, focus on or relate to the extent to which contact effects and social sociolinguistic constraints interact in these sorts of contexts. Um, and to evaluate this, these sorts of questions, we'll, we'll be looking at uh, one linguistic feature in particular, uh, the palatalization of laterals um, in uh, uh, obstruent plus lateral clusters. So uh, in other words, if uh, you take a cluster like cl or gl, uh, palatalization of these laterals, which is an allophonic constraint in this language, would give you something like uh, this. So, yeah, and gear. Yes. Yes. Uh, so for cloche and glass in French, if we like, we've got kioshi uh, and yasi. Uh, palatalization is, I suppose, it's a, a bit of a, um, a bit of a crude label here, given the amount of variation that one observes and has been attested uh, in the literature. But uh, it's the one that tends to stick. Um, one of the interesting things about this, though, is that uh, there's um, that there is some metalinguistic evaluation of this feature, right? Not just amongst linguists who have described it as one of the most widespread features, one of the most diverse, etc. But speakers themselves appear to peg some value, some metalinguistic evaluation to um, to uh, 
uh, this particular feature. So that tells us that they are aware of it to some extent. And the variationist literature has demonstrated to us that where speakers are aware of variation and they have some, uh, some evaluation of it that's, uh, embedded, uh, that's anchored in the community, uh, then there should be some control of that feature too. So we find something similar here at the very least in that speakers are able to point it out or point to it in, in some way, which is, which is uh, telling for us. Uh, and one thing I'd also add is that obviously this allophonic constraint isn't a feature of French, uh, the language that is in contact with Franco Provençal in uh, France and Switzerland, where I've done the fieldwork. Yes. So um, another thing to add quickly, there's obviously as an endangered language that's occupied practically no literature in, in, in sociolinguistics, uh, there's not a lot of spade work on, on, the, uh, on these varieties, uh, but we can rely on uh, some time depth at the very least, uh, not anywhere near as much as say Tam's work, but uh, there's certainly some to go on. Uh, so a good hundred years of linguistic atlases have demonstrated to us at the very least, even with all the problems that are entailed there, such as you know, low data points, um, and so on. Uh, there is evidence of palatalization in the uh, Cle and Gle clusters only in Lyon, where I did uh, my first load of field work. Uh, the picture is a little bit clearer in Saviez, uh, in the Canton of Valais, where we've got a little bit more evidence to go on. Jules Giron in the 1880s was talking about how palatalization in this place is categorical in the Cle and Gle clusters only. And then interestingly, some years later, Jules Jean Jacquet comes in and says that palatalization is uh, variable at this point and in all clusters and tending to disappear. So this isn't uncommon in say the language obsolescence literature when we would observe a relaxing of previously categorical rules. And then Federica Diemo and Andres Cristol's uh, quite impressive audiovisual uh, linguistic atlas of the uh, Valais region um, gives us a little bit more evidence some years later. Unfortunately, just two data points. Uh, but uh, the evidence seems to suggest that there is still variable palatalization, uh, but only in the male speaker to the extent that we can rely on uh, this sort of evidence. Uh, there's a little bit of it left. Um, so uh, basically, just in terms of the research design here, uh, the plan was to uh, working in an, an endangered language, language context, you, you basically take what you can get. Uh, so we ended up with a uh, sample of three different types of speakers, what we might call older fluent speakers, an interwar generation uh, who are sequentially bilingual and now French dominant. Uh, we've got younger speakers who acquired it in uh, late adolescence predominantly. Um, uh, but we're still very much in the community um, growing up. And then we have these new speakers as well, who are adult language learners that have acquired the varieties principally in a language uh, revitalization setting uh, exclusively. And there's been a fair amount of literature recently in the uh, sociolinguistics, uh, in sociolinguistics that have looked at these uh, speakers in particular. So we've got um, um, a mix of different speaker types in our samples, and that leads to some imbalancing, but there's, that's certainly enough to go on. Um, and basically, uh, we've tried to approximate as much as we can the quantitative sociolinguistic socio framework of uh, our speakers to perform different kinds of trans um, elicitation tasks. Um, so we're going to be talking about uh, basically uh, more monitored speech versus more casual speech in the, in the classic sense here. We've got the translation tasks uh, filling in the slot of the more monitored speech style. And we've got the uh, spontaneous speech uh, coming from group interviews that were led by uh, fluent speakers, as I'm not a, a community, uh, a member of this, these, these particular communities. And then we've obviously got the classic sociolinguistic survey stuff to try and pick out language attitudes as well, which gives us around 830-ish tokens, which isn't huge at all, certainly by comparison with Tam's work, for instance, but um, it's not that bad at all for a, a language context that we're working in here. Uh, the long and short of it on the French side of the border is that in 99% of cases and more, uh, we still find palatalization uh, in the Cle and Gle sets only. So this particular linguistic internal constraint is holding on. But what we do see is that there's a fair amount of variability. Uh, so while uh, the special factor of sex here doesn't really give us anything to go on, uh, it demonstrates to us that even within the Vila clusters, we observe a lot of variation. And it's not until we look at uh, what the sociolinguistic literature would call speech style that it gives us anything of an idea of what, of what might be going on here. And uh, the long and 
thought of it is that uh, we said earlier that speakers um, peg some metalinguistic evaluation to this particular feature. Uh, they can point to it, they can talk about it, it marks them out as uh, authentically, it's a feature that marks them out as authentically franco provencal uh, So what is interesting is when speakers are really paying attention to what they're doing, we get lots of this palatalization to kia and gear, uh, and that basically drops off the chart altogether uh, in uh, group interviews and casual speech. So speakers can, are aware of it, they peg some metalinguistic evaluations to it, they strongly favor it, but uh, it's very much a performative thing. Um, and then if you look at the casual speech, it kind of gives us an idea that this feature may well be on its way out because in any of the casual um, speech style uh, data, it didn't really pop up at all. Uh, so yeah, uh, some evidence at least that phonological leveling is underway. Um, and we can actually point to this uh, with data from the uh, Swiss side of the, um, of the border. Uh, so we said previously that in the 1800s, 1880s at least, uh, this was a categorical feature. By the 1930s, have become variable, and by the 1990s, just one speaker out of two was uh, were demonstrating this feature. Well, when I uh, popped in, uh, I, I couldn't observe any tokens of it at all. But what is interesting is that we observe some tokens in the new speaker category for this particular feature. And this is interesting because basically this path towards depalatalization has been reversed by speakers who are militant language learners, who uh, aspire for this authentic Franco-Provençal feature and are quite happy to reintroduce it to mark themselves, to point themselves out as Franco-Provençal. Uh, if we like, almost Franco-Provencal pure et dure. So this tells us that ideologies, attitudes really matter. And even when a feature is dropped off completely, it's been leveled out, it can be reintroduced. So language attitudes matter. Um, so some takeaways here, then part of the, this story is about contact, right? It's uh, an argument can be made for phonological leveling. We've got enough evidence for that, I think. There's palatalization in Sevier's, first described as categorical, then as variable, and now fully depalatalized uh, amongst the uh, older and younger speakers, uh, and change from, in Lyon from a categorical rule to a variable one. But interestingly, we can argue too that this variation appears to be mediated by social factors, right? So features that are strongly or positively evaluated might help them hold on in these particular settings. Uh, we've got the reintroduction of this feature in Sevier's. And um, while the feature has become variable in Lyon, we might argue that because they're aware of this feature and that they seem to be able to control for it across speech styles, this gives us some indication that once categorical rule that has become variable seems to have given rise to some strategic or agentive use of the feature too. So to parrot what's previously been said in the literature, we need to attune to the social in order to understand the, the, the linguistic in, in language contact and um, um, as Peter Trudgill in, in his uh, 1986 uh, Dialects and Contact book has said, and I think also Peter Rostin much more recently in the chat, uh, it's people, not merely dialects or languages uh, that are in contact. Uh, so I will leave it there and hand over to Robin. Thanks, Jonathan. So I'll share my screen with you again. And now, um, you have now heard from all four of us, you've heard about very different time periods, about very different domains of linguistics, about very different methods, um, and also areas, regions in which we have worked. And we want to stop straining your attention and get to the end of it. So what are the takeaways from all the things that you've heard about now? Well, first of all, that language contact can be found and is still found um, basically everywhere and at all times, present, past, and presumably also future, barring any uh, terrible things happening in the next 20 minutes. And that uh, next to all the linguistic work that we have done and will be doing and are doing currently, inevitably we also need to take into account a great number of other extra linguistic uh, features, either external to the language or indeed pertaining to geography, to text types, etc., uh, to, to, sorry, to document types, etc., um, which play a decisive role in deciding whether language contact has happened or plays a decisive role at all, and if so, how it does so, and to what extent it can be made responsible for the changes that we observe. What we haven't been able to show you, and what I think we'd be all hard pressed to do, is a predictive model. You know, show you saying, yes, this must be how it's going to happen, um, so it better be. Um, but rather, we require and are relying upon other instruments, especially comparative data from all kinds of other studies and typological information that we glean from changes that happen both language internally and through external influence in the languages, languages around the world. 
And so it is very important that, you know, as a linguistic community in general, we cooperate and communicate with one another, as we four of us have done in this particular talk, learning from each other and trying to make our individual works fit into one more or less whole presentation. But it also bears uh, to keep in mind uh, one of the expressions of what language content can and cannot do, uh, as Thomason has written in one of her articles. Well, you know, in principle, everything is possible because language and all the extra linguistic features that we have to take into account are very, very complex. But that doesn't mean that everything is equally probable. And so it is with that delightful little quip that we leave you to ask us questions about details, about generalities, and just remind you that A, the slides will be available later for everyone, and that if you want to look at the references, there is a separate list there available, and these will all be on the Filstock website at some point soon. And with that, we thank you for your attention and hope that you have many interesting questions and or discussion points. Cheers. Fantastic. Well, thank you all very much for an incredibly rich, um, varied and yeah, fantastic presentation. Um, as you already kind of covered in your, in your summary, all sorts of aspects of uh, linguistics, um, different social contexts, different time depths, different methodologies, really great to see that in the kind of broader um, theme of, of contact linguistics. So that's brilliant. Thank you all very much. Um, yeah, so there is time uh, for discussion, questions from the audience. Um, I know in the in the chat, I think there were already some questions sort of early on, um, some of which have perhaps been answered or, or addressed. Um, but yeah, do feel free to uh, put the question in the chat if you like, or you can uh, raise your virtual hand uh, on my screen, that's a reaction button at the bottom, or you can also raise your actual hand and I will try and see that if you're struggling with that. But do we have any any questions or comments for the for the panelists to start us off? Maybe while we're waiting for people to uh, type um, or, or sort of yeah, gather their questions, we can go back to the point which again, Jonathan, I think you touched on towards the end, but we had a question in the chat from, from Peter Austin about yeah, contact essentially being between uh, people, um, not, not languages. Um, I wonder if anyone else wants to sort of comment on the ideologies and the beliefs sort of aspect of things. I know a few of you kind of touched on that, but does anyone want to expand on that? The panelists, it's probably easier if you just unmute yourself. I think probably what, what I'd add is, thanks Hannah, is that um, I, um, I've noticed in, in much more recent publications of language contact, particularly in handbooks, that there does seem to be a lot more um, space being devoted to sociolinguistic approaches to contact, which is which is really nice to see, which which demonstrates to us, as Robin's pointed out, and as people like Sarah Thomason have already advocated for, is that linguists talk across disciplines. And and uh, just, just to reiterate that, I suppose that I, I think there's value in that, certainly. Um, and, and I think it's, I hope it's worked reasonably well here. And I go even further than that and say, sort of, as, as you say, Thomason and uh, Jaron Matras as well have pointed out, you know, as soon as one individual in their idiolect makes use of a weird and wonderful pattern that they've borrowed from a cont language, from that point on, it's in principle possible that, you know, this pattern, depending on the station and on the context of the speaker, uh, can develop into, into something more and or completely fail. And so the individual is very much at the center of what we do. But at the same time, you know, especially if you work in times before speech recording or where you know, failing the invention of time machines, where we can't access the individual speakers, it becomes very, very difficult to um, not forget about that and not see these languages as you know, a grammar book that you've at one point absorbed uh, and now try to um, make sense of the data that you actually meet in in the wild as it were so it's as you say very important to keep this in mind constantly awesome fantastic so i have a question in in the chat which i think it came in first and then i'll come to, to peter austin who's got his hand up so this is a question for victoria um the greek i'm afraid uh eva you might see the chat yourself as well, remains a word um, used to give orders or express wishes in Cretan Greek dialect. Could this be because of Crete's proximity to Egypt and past contact over generations, in your view? Yeah, I'm guessing we're talking about a modern Cretan dialect, just as a question back to the person who asked the question. Could you just confirm this? 
It says uh, modern yeah, Greek. Yes, thank indeed. you. <laughs> good, just to make sure I'm not commenting randomly and stuff and I'm rambling on. Um, I think this whole Hina feature or it then becomes Na um, spreads much more widely. So the tiny little bit I was interested in um, in this kind of presentation was just when you see it kind of for the first time um, in Egypt in the third, fourth centuries. Um, I think there's quite a lot of discussion going on about um, how this feature then develops further. Um, I kind of, I don't want to say yes and I don't want to say no as to whether there's continuity with Egypt. Bear in mind for that continuity that Greek disappears from Egypt with the Arab conquest. So from the what is it um, from the seventh, eighth centuries onwards, you kind of lose this continuity of Greek in Egypt, meaning that proximity that is alluded to here in the question then does no longer really work. So you don't have this kind of large area where you use Greek or where you use this kind of specific variety of Greek in Egypt. So that would be maybe the caveat I put in here. Um, but yeah, generally speaking about this whole hina na particle, I think there's a lot going on. Um, a lot of people having a lot of ideas. Um, I will not say yes or no to continuity, I think. Fantastic. Thanks for that. Sounds, uh, sounds uh, wise. Uh, Peter Austin, I think you had your hand up um, before. Yes, um, I'm, I'm just curious about whether um, the kind of network based analysis of, of say, the Milroy's um, could also play a role in just thinking about what Jonathan was talking about and also the Norwegian case. So the locus of change is not just the individual, but it's also the networks that that individual engages with. And, you know, we know from Mil the work of Milroy and Milroy that there are people who, and, and also Lebov, there are people who lead change and through change spreads through the networks of the impacts of those individuals. I mean, has anyone been looking at that kind of thing recently in language context? I mean, yeah, I certainly tried to apply the uh, the social network model of the Milroy's in, in my work. And uh, it is to a greater or lesser extent, you know, predictive of uh, it is, you're able to demonstrate, right? Uh, uh, patterns of behavior between different groups, if you've got them. Um, it, it, I think it depends on the kind of community you're looking at, right? The sort of community that the Norwegians were working in was very different to the sort of community I was talking about, where you've kind of got very different kinds of speakers that don't necessarily get on, and there are very, very few of them anyway. So there are limitations to uh, its, its predictions and modeling, but it is it has been applied in, in, in other contexts too, similar to ones that I've talked about. So yeah, I think the answer is yes for me, Peter. Yeah, and I would add to that. So I've also done some work on um, modeling of linguistic change, um, not necessarily contact effects, but change in general, uh, that's spreading through populations and through space. And I think um, we're probably going to we're going to assume that underlying most of the kind of observations we might make about how different subpopulations or locations or whatever lead or lag behind in change, underlying that probably are network effects. But the problem is that getting a if you want to look at those patterns, you probably need a big enough sample of speakers that you're going to be, it's going to be pretty much impossible to actually uncover the real structure of the network. And if you have a small enough number of speakers that you can uncover the structure of the network, it's probably too small to see real um, spatial or demographic effects with any confidence. So I think like the kind of stuff I've been doing here where I'm like showing change distributed across space, in, in a way what I'm doing is uncovering exactly this kind of network effects, but they're very zoomed out. So you can't actually see that that's what it is. Did any of the other panelists want to come in on that point? I think we've, yeah. Uh, Robin? My, so my data basically looks like um, a lot of social networks. So that all the papyrus letters are assembled in like, um, in archives, we call them. And they usually kind of, um, they are kind of all the letters that were sent to one person or that if we're very lucky that come from one um, little village. Um, so kind of, I think, because it's kind of data that is not can't be compared with something like what Jonathan is working on. Obviously, you don't see this network effects quite as nicely, but the basic idea is very much that that you kind of have a network and someone in the center and that that influences um, or kind of then makes variations also spread. And, and my work relies far too much on 
literary work that sometimes we have trouble dating to the right century. So, you know, getting down to speaker and uh, effects like that is rather difficult. But I, I've had one instance where um, something like Network could be seen where a, a biblical translator in classical Armenian was very clearly uh, influenced in his own language used by the way that the Bible was translated. So by the, you know, the, the community of translators that he worked with and where you could see sort of bleeding of biblical style Armenian into original Armenian, but you know, that it's ephemeral more than anything else. And, you know, um, doesn't compare to, as Victoria said, any of the detailed analyses that you can do with, with modern data. Fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, Paul Russell, I think you have your, your hand up. Any question? Um, yes. Uh, thank you very much to all of you. That was really very interesting. Um, I had a question which kind of just wanted to pull something out that I think Jonathan and, and Tamsin both kind of touched on sort of implicitly in what they were doing. Um, I wondered about the challenges that are presented by thinking about language contact between very closely related languages as opposed to relatively unrelated languages and how the what those differences are and how one copes with that. Should I yeah, jump in first here? I think like there's there's um, yes, this is a big problem in the stuff I've been doing because dealing with Norwegian, one thing I didn't mention is that it's obviously also in contact with Swedish the whole time. And Swedish, Norwegian, Danish, we're really talking about dialect contact there, not language contact. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem is this this means that it's very hard to it effectively presents a new methodological challenge because almost any feature probably occurs somewhere in all three of these areas and the borders of all of them are fuzzy. So, I, I mean, I it's a methodological problem that I would end up trying to solve with the same kind of methods I did here with mm. teasing up the middle low German versus Danish contact, which is that um, dialect contact might make particular predictions about spatial social group in which you expect um, features to occur. Um, there is, I think, some theoretical work that is yet to be done on whether the kind of simplification through imperfect second language learning, those sorts of effects, whether that also applies in situations of intensive dialect contact, um, which I don't think I have a definitive opinion on. But um, yeah, yeah, it's definitely an interesting set of problems. Uh, Paul, can I ask you to repeat the question, mostly because I had a barking dog just as you, uh, <laughs> the, the perils of working from home, and I completely missed it. You'll have to forgive me. Yes, it's uh, the dog barking in the, yeah. Anyway, um, uh, the, um, no, I was, what I was asking about was the, the challenges presented by um, uh, language contact between very closely related languages, as opposed to languages that are kind of less closely related, and the particular challenge, and Tamsin was talking about kind of what happens when you get down to the kind of dialect level. Um, and I think that's actually precisely where the issues are. And I just want, you know, that was my general question to all of you. Yeah, really. yeah no, no, I think yeah, I wouldn't add much more to than what Tamsin's already provided there, yeah. Hmm. Fantastic. Do we have any other, other questions, other comments? Um, I had one more question that I can sort of take as a as a uh, chair. I was wondering, I mean, we've sort of talked a little bit about challenges, but yeah, perhaps for each of you. So yeah, whether it's having, you know, two speakers in a certain case or, you know, I um, think Tamsin, you talked about not quite knowing where documents were necessarily from. Um, if you each could sort of comment perhaps on, yeah, what that kind of key, perhaps if I only had this uh, information, what, you know, kind of wish list, uh, basically. I mean, I mean, my problem, I suppose, if I just jump in quickly, has just been more poverty of the data than anything else. You know, just getting a hold of speakers that are prepared to talk to you in these sorts of communities where, you know, for, for decades now, they've been marginalized, told that the language they speak are no good. You know, we, we know all of these stories as linguists. Uh, the general public might not. Uh, so just getting them to talk to you is a challenge. Uh, so, you know, while the speakers are there, I can access them, right? So it's some of the, you know, that so people working with a lot of time depth can't do. It presents challenges of its own in terms of trying to gain trust and trying to speak to them. Um, and you can always do with more data um, in that respect. That was a kind of a, a real problem. And to, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I was going to say, I suspect all of our answers mean if only I had, it might be if only I had more data of some sort. Um, but, and the more data I would like would be uh, different genres. I, the, 
um, the texts I work with are very formulaic, which is extremely helpful in one sense in that it means you're working with a really consistent genre for this entire period. But it also means that it's very much harder to kind of elucidate the relationship between text, uh, written, writing and speech. So um, yeah, if only, if only documents other than legal documents had survived from Norway in this period, that would be great. <laughs> Victoria or Robin, do you want to add anything to the more data plea? I'll, I'll just add one example. So uh, my research makes certain predictions about uh, diachronic development of these alignment patterns and what we're expected to see. And one test case would be a debated piece of literature that is either from the 5th or from the 8th century AD. And um, there are political factions that discuss uh, where it might be from. And, you know, my test case would be wonderful and could show either or if it weren't for the fact that it's literature and literature can adapt or uh, rather imitate styles so you know we have to ha uh, hang on to minute details to s take them as evidence of x y or z and it would be so lovely to again have more in this case extra linguistic data to just know whether this guy um, is an imitator or a the real thing from the fifth century Fantastic, wonderful. Um, well, I think we can uh, leave it there. I don't see any other questions. There are lots of fantastic and enthusiastic comments um, and praise in the chat. So thank you all for a yeah, very stimulating, uh, rich talk. And I think people are particularly impressed on how you've drawn out common threads, but also through yeah, separate kind of presentations that were so expertly woven together. So thank you all very much. Um, we give you a sort of virtual applause um, and yes.